Maybe you've seen this image. The left one, that's Reader's Digest. They're telling us what every state is the best at and the worst at. California, it says, is the best at being diverse. Wow. <laughs> Great. And it's the worst at quality of life. People are fleeing the state. <laughs> Now, the right one, that's a USA Today article. That one's telling us the best thing about a state and the worst thing about a state. They say the best thing about Maine is it's just so safe. It's so nice. Might be a good place to raise a family. And they tell us the worst thing about Maine is it's the least diverse. Oh, man, 94.4% white. What a terrible problem. Now, of course, if that's the worst thing about Maine, ah, that's not bad at all. Now, Maine isn't the only one with this problem. Just check out this article from the New York Times. This one made a big splash when it was published last year. The title is, New Hampshire, 94% white, asks, how do you diversify a whole state? Clearly, they want to solve their problem of being too white. Or at least someone wants to solve it. The article goes on to tell us the story of Catalina who used to be able to speak Spanish to all the people around her back when she lived in Colombia. That's where she's from. But when she moved to an area of white English speakers, she didn't get to speak Spanish the way she used to. The New York Times tells us that these white English speakers have really, quote, posed an array of problems for new arrivals. That's you, by the way, white English speakers. You're an array of problems for Catalina. The New York Times says the white areas are an, quote, ethnic vacuum. <laughs> this is just another way to say that whites have no culture, whites have no ethnicity, we're blank slates, everyone else is a colorful, wonderful mess of ethnicity and culture. And you know, I've traveled. I've been very fortunate. I've gone to many great places. I've met many great people. And you know, it's a unique experience when you get to go somewhere and meet someone who's never seen someone of your race before. You know, they always want to take pictures. I've been in countries where no one has looked like me. And I've been to places where no one has spoken my language. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no problem. If there's any problem at all, it's my problem. It's my array of problems. It's not theirs. They're not guilty of not being welcoming because no one looks like me. They don't have a problem because their directions, their maps, and their menus aren't in my language. I don't go into their communities and accuse them of being an ethnic vacuum. Imagine if you went to South Korea with someone and you went to a real nice small South Korean village. And that other person you went with said to you, wow, it's so Asian over here. Don't they have any menus in English? Think, how much would you have to hate the Koreans to say that about them? How much would you have to hate them to go to their land where they live and speak their language and think it needs to change or it's not good enough? Imagine if you went to Nigeria and said, God, look at how black it is here. What an ethnic vacuum. <laughs> so when you hear someone say how awfully white an area is, how much it needs diversity, you know what kind of hate they have for us. When they move to our land and are dismayed that we are different from where they came from and we haven't been sufficiently replaced with Spanish-speaking mestizos, you know that they hate us. You know, and it's weird, you know, you have all these jokes online about stupid American tourists. They go halfway around the world, and then they complain about the local food, the local custom, the local language. You know, they're over there wearing American flag t-shirts with cameras hanging around their necks, and they're saying, where's the McDonald's, right? You, this is this uh, stereotype of this, like... Uh, awful American tourist. And while some of those people might exist, I mean, I don't doubt it, uh, they're probably not very fun for the locals to be around. The silver lining to that dark cloud is they're tourists. Eventually they leave. The locals don't have to deal with their garbage attitudes anymore when they're gone. 
but Catalina comes here to live permanently and complains about us. If Americans are bad because sometimes when we travel we don't like the local flair and we act like idiots about it, what does that say about immigrants who move to a place where they don't like the local flair? What if you moved to Korea and then you told the Koreans that their constant use of Korean in their homogenous country created an array of problems for you? God. <laughs> oh, man, I laugh because it's just so ridiculous. It's so over the top. Like, it's hard to believe that this is actually happening. And yet, these white Americans, who are supposed to be some sort of, like, judgmental cultural chauvinists, hardly make a peep as they get walked all over. They get treated in a way that would be unacceptable and made fun of if they do it to others. And yet, they're not rioting because people like Catalina. I can only wonder, why? Is it true that we are as pathetic as I fear we are? If we did this to them, some of them might have some balls, and we would be in big trouble. But let's look at some of these diversity pushers. You know, they celebrate the white population being outnumbered, becoming a minority. You had these 100-plus Democrats, uh, these senators and representatives, they sent a letter saying that the Federal Reserve is too white and too male. Well, let's look at some of these Democrat elite. Obama, he just bought that mansion in Martha's Vineyard, 90% white there. MSNBC said that the Jew Bernie Sanders admitted his campaign is too white. Keep in mind, this is Bernie Sanders, born in wonderful multicultural New York City, fled to Vermont, one of the whitest states in the country. These anti-white, pro-diversity elites extol the virtues of diversity. But they wouldn't be caught dead living in it. They want to live amongst whites in homogenous communities. Maybe they'll bring in a non-white limousine driver. Maybe they'll have some Mexicans landscape. You know, they'll have them manicure their privacy hedges. Uh, you know, you don't want to have to look at the scum who walks down the sidewalks or waits at bus stops. Those privacy hedges really help. Because being subjected to diversity is beneath them. That's for blue-collar whites who can't afford to get away from it. It's really interesting how hateful of poor whites many of the elites show themselves to be. And I don't just mean the Democrat elites. The entire term white trash is pretty much just an attack and contempt for poor whites or whites who can't afford what they can. So this image here that I'm showing you, this is United States Army soldiers pointing their rifles at white students, marching them at pointed bayonet to a school where they would be forced to attend with black students. You know, they say this is civil rights. Now, where are these kids' civil rights? Who knows? They get forced into an integrated school. Meanwhile, even in the modern day, 2019, Democrat elites make sure their children don't have to mix with the general public and instead attend private schooling institutions or get tutors. Diversity for you, not for them. But it's not just the limousine liberals and their wads of cash who have engaged in this kind of behavior. It's the middle-class white boomer who has done the same crap. They're so excited to hire an illegal alien to redo the roof of his house so he can save a thousand or two. You know, because he didn't have to hire a local white American. And with all that money he saved, he'll be able to spend it on maintaining his Harley Davidson motorcycle, or his saltwater fish tank, or restoring that old muscle car, or whatever else stupid hobby he has. Meanwhile, his son loses his job at the sawmill, when the mill is undercutting American labor by hiring immigrants of questionable illegal status. So, you know, he'll talk to his son and he'll give him some platitudes about, you just gotta roll up your sleeves, son. Pick yourself up by the bootstraps. Get back on that horse. It's really interesting to see a generation of Americans largely, not totally, but largely, betray their own children. 
but I'm white, you know, so I talk about things from a white perspective, but we can try and think about things from other perspectives too, because reality is diversity sucks no matter who you are. No one is hit quite as hard by immigration than the black community, at least percentage wise. Most black communities have a huge interest in trying to increase wages and lower cost of living and improve employment opportunities, right? And immigration has a huge negative effect on all of those, especially when it's unchecked and happens very quickly. Our middle class white boomer could have hired to pay a black American to do that work, but he would have had to pay somewhere probably in between the white American and the illegal, and that's still too much, right? He would still rather turn his back on both white Americans and black Americans to just pay an illegal, so that way, you know, he'll have a little bit more fun money for his toys. So let's just try and look at this objectively as possible. Is diversity a strength? which is this motto. It's more like a mantra that's repeated over and over religiously. I did a quick search on Wikipedia for anti-racist and civil rights organizations just in the United States. And I quickly filled a spreadsheet with tons of organizations. I haven't even begun to approach the actual number of organizations that exist due to diversity. There are so many community advocacy groups based on race of all kinds. And it would be a difficult task just to list them. But keep in mind, these organizations wouldn't exist if we were separate. How many black people put a huge amount of work, so many man hours, into black advocacy groups because they live in a multiracial society? What could they be doing with that time if they just lived in their own nation? Those man hours could go into building schools, creating gardens that would produce wholesome food, writing music. Maybe they could write a play. Instead of a racial community advocacy group, they could start a community theater that would enrich their community. If diversity is such a strength, why is it such a huge, massive drain on our time and money? If diversity was a strength, it might save us time, not be a giant sinkhole that consumes it. How do you diversify a whole state, going back to New Hampshire? How does New Hampshire become diverse? I'm not sure how they'll do it, but I'll tell you this much. As they become more multiracial, they will have to spend more and more and more time on racial advocacy and anti-racism and civil rights and all that stuff. And it won't be making anyone's life any better than if we were just separate. Diversity is conflict. That's the main point. Diversity itself is conflict. And I talked about that in my Multiculturalism is a Joke video, if you want to see that. Now, what will happen to you if you stand up and you say you don't like diversity? What will happen to you if you say that white people shouldn't be replaced in their own lands? Well, I can tell you what might happen to you if you're an American. People will stand up angrily and they'll say to you, well, whites did this to the Native Americans. Now it should be done to you. <laughs> Oh, man, this is my favorite. That's my favorite response. I love it because it reveals something. And you know what it reveals, right? I think most people I speak with are pretty sharp. Here's what it reveals, just in case you missed it. They consider what is done to the Native Americans to be bad. They think it's evil. And they want it done to us. Diversity isn't a strength. It's a punishment. And they're admitting it. You're white. Screw you. Here's diversity. The whiter you are, the more you deserve the bad things that happen when you get diversified. That's why they're pushing for it to happen in white areas. And no one is saying that Nigerians need to be replaced in their own lands. People aren't going down to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and saying, screw all these blacks. We need more non-blacks here to take over. Many thousands of YouTube channels have been removed. In fact, tens of thousands of channels. Black Pigeon Speaks, I guess, had such a large audience, he was able to get reinstated. Yet, many others will never get reinstated. James Allstup still is banned, and he had like a half million. What does that say for everyone who had 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000? They're gone forever. Now, next week, if I still exist, I want to discuss free speech. Does anyone support this free speech thing anymore? Because I kind of think 
Free speech supporters are very few and very far between. Check me out on Gab and BitChute. It might be difficult to find me here, depending on what happens.